So the crewman looks at me and he says, they're hunting police. I don't know what to do with that information. It was, it was just what's happening. And it was actually a lot later than that. It was several hours after that, that we actually discovered that we were in the middle of a coup. I'm Jessica. And I'm David. And this is Passports and Birth Control, a couple's take on international travel. So we really, really wanted to go to Istanbul. Of course we did. It's a wonderful city, beautiful history, incredible people. Why would you not want to go to Istanbul? It's one of the classical cities. One of the oldest cities. One of the oldest, longest inhabited cities in Europe. It's, it's a fantastic city with so much to see. So what's for U.S. citizens, the first thing you need to remember is you actually do need a visa. But the good thing is... This is not like Cuba. It's not like other visas where you have to go through an approval process. You have to write to the embassy or you have to get some sort of uh, approval from someone who lives there. Super easy, easiest visa. Essentially, it's a tax to get into the country. Right. You pay $51.50. Now, that price has gone up. When we were there, it was something around 35 something each. Like that. You can do this in advance uh, through a variety of online sources. When you buy it, it's good for six months, but when you use it, that's it. So you one entry for $51, and you stay there uh, for 90 days, mm -hmm. but... You can once you buy it, you can use it up until a six month period. Right. You can get it at the airport after you land. It's a little bit more expensive, but it is doable. So right. if you want some more flexibility, you can buy it at the airport when you get there. But it's really easy to get it in advance, and it lasts six months. And you can buy it when you buy your, your airline tickets. So since you're buying your tickets anyway, just knock the other part out while you're there. So again, you can always stay in a hotel, but in Istanbul, the hostels are amazing. We stayed in an old hostel in the old city. Most of these hostels have rooftop bars. They're not very expensive. They're pretty easy to get into. And these rooftop bars are a great way to sit and enjoy some raka and watch the sunset over the city, which is really an experience. And a lot of them will have meals there. Breakfast oftentimes right. is included, so they'll be breakfast up on the rooftop. The best thing about these little hostels is just sitting on that rooftop and watching the sunset. Oh, absolutely. And you can see everything. It's just gorgeous. And these places are cheap. They are cheap. Uh, relatively speaking, you're right in the middle of the city. You're in what's called the old city. And the old city is where you want to be. That's, that's where, where the history is. That's where all the cool stuff is. Now, that, at least for us. Right. If you're in, into clubbing and the bar scene and all that, maybe you can find that. But that's not really what Istanbul's known for. We're history for. buffs. Yeah, Istanbul is known for its ancient heritage. And the old city is where it is. Now, the old city includes the Hagia Sophia, one of the oldest churches in Europe. And frankly, one in my opinion, one of the most beautiful. It is no longer an active church, it is now a museum, but you can see the layers of history built in this place when it was a church, when it was a mosque. Um, it's 1,500 years old, or not quite. It was built around the 500s by one of the old Roman emperors. Mm -hmm. So you walk in this place, and you're just like, any building that is over 1,000 years old. Has weight. Oh my gosh. You just feel like you're, you, you were collapsed with the gravity of the building. Yes. There's mosaics everywhere. Now, when the, when the Turks conquered Constantinople mm -hmm. in 1453... And became Istanbul. And became Istanbul. It was turned into a mosque. It was. So it's a really interesting heritage site. The minarets were built after the conquest, uh, the Muslim minarets around it, but the, the cathedral itself was originally a church. And so you can see the blending of the two. Right, the plastered over Christian mosaics, the more recent Islamic additions. Right, they've got these big wooden discs with... Because you're not allowed to have visual representation in, in Islam. So right. they've got very interesting geometric patterns and calligraphic uh, passages from the Quran placed out around there. And they've reintroduced the Christian mosaics because they're beautiful. And they uncovered them because they were plastered over. And so that plaster was removed to reveal these beautiful Christian mosaics. So when you're in that building, you can just see everything. You can see the place where the emperor was crowned. Right. You can see the, the, the little place in the back that points towards Mecca that where the, it was turned into a mosque, but it's just a gorgeous, wonderful building, and you have to go there. It's, it's a great harmonious blend of its entire long history. Yeah, and just the weight of it. But right across the square, the the uh, Sultan Ahmet Square is, is, is where it, the, the old city, really, that's where it is, and it's flanked by the Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque on either end. The Blue Mosque is a fascinating building. It was built right after the conquest, uh, so it's quite old itself, uh, well over 500 years old. 
and it is very young compared to the Hygieia. Yeah, a thousand. Yeah, it's it's old. when when something is five hundred years old and it's considered young, that's how old the city is. Right. So it's a 500-year-old building, and it's gorgeous. When I was talking about the geometric patterns in the Hagia Sophia, the Blue Mosque takes that up to 11. It does. There's these tiles and everything, and it's called the Blue Mosque because you've got these blue tiles. The whole thing is just gets this faint blue. and Inside and out. Inside and out, and it's just huge, and it's gorgeous. But uh, be advised, if you're not familiar with the customs of Islam, you have to wear long pants. It is an active mosque. It is an active place of worship. And so you do need to approach it with a certain degree of cultural respect. For instance, when we went, he was wearing a t-shirt and jeans. I chose to wear a maxi skirt and a t-shirt, knowing that bare shoulders were not okay. I also wore an infinity scarf I could pull over my head because women are not allowed to have bare heads in a mosque. What I do wish I had done, I should have worn a cardigan because bare arms on a woman are absolutely not allowed. So I did have to borrow a shawl to cover up my arms. So ladies, I would recommend taking a cardigan to wear into an active mosque. Usually Istanbul is quite warm, so this can be something maybe you, if you, this is why it's a great idea to get a hostel in the old city. You can leave your change of clothes in the old city right. and come back. On the other end of the square, going back towards the Hagia Sophia, right. tucked back behind the Hagia Sophia is a little walled off area called the Top Copy Palace. Beautiful. Definitely a worthwhile destination because if you go, we, 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 we backpacked all over Europe. We got to see all the old European medieval palaces and they're neat and all. They are. This is unique. I appreciate the fact that it's unlike anything else I've ever seen. It's instead of one big building, like I said, Istanbul's kind of warm. They have a bunch of essentially one single story chambers and areas spread out in very open air, very breezy, very the, cool. Yeah, it, it fits with the environment and it, it has that. And this is the Ottoman palace, right? So it's not trying to be a European palace, Absolutely it's its not. own thing. And they've got some really interesting cultural heritage uh, things, they've got a lot of really interesting religious uh, objects yes. on display. And you can see all the really th they have, uh, they have really unique things. They've got the throne room, which was really neat. They've got that golden cage where and they, they kept the air to keep him safe. Yeah, really interesting thing about Ottoman history that they, they they would have a bunch of brothers and sons that would be murdered essentially in order to claim the throne. But that's when when you have monarchy, and you've got heirs to the throne. There's going to be a lot of murdering going on. So you see that throughout European history, right? So so, but it was interesting the, their way of, of of saving this and. You get to see all this this harem stuff, and, and it's just a really unique place. Definitely a worthwhile trip. Definitely. So the night after we saw all these old city places, we're just falling in love head over heels with Istanbul. We decide, you know what, let's take an evening cruise. And they've got these really affordable packages where you can get a dinner cruise that takes you up and down the waterway, which is called the Bosporus. Right. That encircles the city. So what makes Istanbul and Constantinople really interesting from a defensive perspective is it's surrounded by water on three sides. So it's kind of like a triangular peninsula. So they only had to build one set of walls to protect the city. The rest is the Bosphorus, uh, the, the water around it. So we're like, we're, let's take this waterway. It's the best way to see the city and we'll get some dinner along the way. Absolutely. Now on this cruise, they had dancers, folk dancers, and they had folk songs, tr traditional music. I got turned into a belly dancer. He did. She um, <laughs> pulled this shirt, tucked it in. It gave was him it was so funny. Bosoms. She was doing this uh the, the, this belly dance routine. Belly dance. She was calling out for volunteers. No one volunteered. She grabbed him. She grabbed me, pulled me up. She tucked in my shirt. She said, "You're a belly dancer now." <laughs> it, it was adorable. <laughs> so. After dinner, after the dancing, everyone else on the boat decides that they want to dance, so it becomes sort of like a dance cruise. Well, we had gone on this cruise so we can see the city. So, so we go up top to watch the city go by. Yeah, this nice rooftop area. It was a little bit chilly, but that was probably why we were the only ones up there. It was there. very refreshing after the hot day. It was nice. We were up there. It was just us and the crew. So we're seeing the, the, the city at night, and I see this Turkish flag, this giant Turkish flag, and it's at half-mast. Now, my assumption was the truck attack in Nice had just happened. A terrorist so, attack had killed a whole bunch of people in Right, nice. this horrible attack in Nice. And so I said, well, they're probably just showing grief and sympathy, um, sympathy for the attack in Nice. And when we got to the furthest extent of the cruise, we actually saw the bridge that crosses from the Asian side to the European side, this big bridge, and it's lit up red, white, and blue. Which furthered my assumption that 
solidarity with Nice. The French flag. So, okay. We start heading back, but I, I see that flag again. I'm like, something is... Not this, right. I've got a bad feeling. Right. And I start looking at the crew. Like I said, it's only just us and the crew on the top deck. And the crew are all looking at their cell phones. They're kind of gathered together. you got that sort of sixth sense that when human beings are clustered and there's that body language, they're a bit agitated. So I walk over to him and I say, hey, what's going on? And he looks at me. And one of these crewmen says, they're hunting police. That those are not words you want to hear on a cruise. Now, I had no idea what he was talking about. Is this some sort of heist? Is there some criminal activity going on and they're killing police for no... Like, what's going on? Because obviously, when, when you're talking about the Nice terrorist attack, which happened that day, your right. mind goes to terrorism. A week before we landed, there was a terrorist attack at the Istanbul air airport. There was. It shot up and blew up a whole bunch of people at the arrival station. And there were police everywhere right. guarding every site. So... Yes, terrorism was on your, our mind, but hunting police? It, it was not a good thing. It didn't make any sense. But I step away, and I know a little bit about Turkish history, and I know they've had several coups in the past. So I look to Jessica and I say, this might be a coup. There might be a coup happening. And you definitely got the sense that something was going wrong because this cruise was supposed to end at, like, what, 11? 11 or so. We don't get back to the dock until after midnight. It's late. So it's late. We're at the dock. We're wondering what's going we on. Circled the dock we circled the dock, look, waiting for a time. Because what we didn't know, we later found out, there was a coup. And most of the protesters against the coup we're at Taksim Square. Which is where our boat was supposed to dock like, and let he, it back Here's home. the square, here's the docks. We are right in the heart of it. We are square in it. So they get docked. Now that crewman who had told me they're hunting police, I keep watch on him because for some reason him and I had a connection. He's like, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that you don't get, you know, we have no idea what's going to happen. We don't know. So he decides, I don't know if this is his plan from the beginning or what, but we took a van from our hostel to the dock. That's how we got there. When we get to the dock, we, we're, we're supposed to find our van driver. He was going to be waiting for us, and he would take us and a bunch of other people at hotels. And he was. Yeah, and he was there. But the crewman took off his crew jacket and put on a regular jacket, and he joined us. He rode us with us back to our various <laughs> hostels. And so he, he helped escort us, and we were, I remember we were following through the crowds just through the thick of it. Just, just I was like, as long as I keep my eye on this bus driver... I had a death grip on the back of his shirt. So I'm like, this, this. If I lose this van driver, there are so many people. I'm gonna get lost in this crowd, and we'll have no idea how to get back. Now I, I kept on going through worst case scenarios. Like, well, what if we have to walk? We're not that far from our hostel, and we're no longer in the old city. Where Taxim Square is, is on the other side of a little bridge. Right, not the big bridge. Not the big bridge. Like I said, Istanbul is surrounded on three sides by water, the old city that is. So the rest of the city expands beyond it. We're in a little bit beyond that. We gotta go back over the water into the old city. Now in my mind, if there's a revolution happening, they're not gonna mess with the old city. That's right. Th whatever regime takes power, they're gonna leave the Hagia Sophia. They value alone. the history of the old city. So we feel I will feel protected there. I'm not feeling very protected at Taxim no. Square. So we get in our van, thankfully. The crewman joins us and he spends the entire drive back cussing out the radio, listening to the radio. I have we no assume idea. he's cursing. He's speaking in Turkish, so we're not entirely sure, but there's a cadence to swearing. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a dangerous situation. This is one of the few times I have, and I couldn't resist. We get into the van, and I'm buckling my seat by. I look at Jessica. She'd been quiet up until this. She was she was just keep head on her shoulders. Everything's fine. No panic or whatever. And I look at her, and I say, buckle up. There's revolution in the air. At that point, I put my head between my knees because, <laughs> wow. That was a terrible thing to say. Really I was, was like, oh, I'm in an action movie. I should say something action-y like Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever. No, don't, don't, don't pause to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Just keep your head on your shoulders and, <laughs> and do that. But thankfully, well, we, we're, we're stressed on the van. Of course we are. So we make it back to the hostel, and the hostel owner is sitting outside smoking a cigarette. He sees us, white faces, and he says, don't worry, these things happen. Yeah, he just kind of puts his hand up. He's like, you know, like, like he's embarrassed about the, the, the revolution that's going on around him. <laughs> Somehow this does not make us feel any better. Right. <laughs> so we go back to our room. We're hiding out up there. We're listening to the BBC on David's tablet. Um, we're trying to get on Twitter. We're trying to get on Facebook, assure our family and friends that we're okay. 
But they keep cutting in and out. Or... Yeah, Twitter and Facebook were up, but then they were down, and they were up, and they were down. And we kind of had this idea that if social media and the internet gets put, suppressed... Then we're in trouble. We're in trouble. And it kind of kept going out. The internet stayed there, so we were able to keep streaming BBC going, and we were able to keep coverage of what was going on through that. Right, so thank God for the BBC. Because when we look out our window, the old city's just deserted. And there was a straight cat out quiet. there. quiet. <laughs> yes, it was very quiet. But in the distance, you could hear machine guns going off. And so my beloved husband here is leaning head and shoulders out the window. I hear machine gun fire. I did. I heard machine gun fire, but I'm leaning out my window because I want to see where it's coming from, see how far it's away. But she's thinking... Stray bullet! So I'm chastising him, saying, get your head back in the window before I'm widowed in a foreign country. In the middle of a revolution. In the middle of a revolution. <laughs> what I was actually doing, and I told her this later, I was leaning out the window because I had in my mind, worst case scenario, a bunch of crowds come in, they're looking for tourists, right. maybe to, to just, just kill foreigners or whatever. I don't know. I'm worst case, what's going on. Worst case scenario worst thinking. Case. And so I'm like, okay, if a bunch of crowds come in and they're just going to get, get all of us, I need to find a way to get out of this room. So I'm looking out the window, like, okay, if I jump down to that sill and we can jump onto that dumpster, we're on like the third floor, we can get on the ground and we can run, and then we can get a bus, we can smuggle ourselves to Greece, and we, oh, what, what's going to have to happen here? Um, Which is not to say we were panicking. We're actually doing a surprisingly good job of keeping our heads on our shoulders and looking for escape routes in case of... Worst case right, these were worst case scenarios that were running through in a logical manner, but we keep on telling ourselves, okay, if this revolution happens, uh, this could be a problem because treaties and customs agents, that can be an issue. We're right. worried about getting to our next destination, which was Greece. If we were, once we get to Greece, we'll be safe. We're not right. leaving for two days, though. Right. All the flights kept on getting canceled. Everything shut down. We're thinking, okay... The best case scenario here is actually if this coup fails. Right. So just a big brief history lesson what's happening. President Erdogan was the president at the time. And he wanted to take Turkey in one direction and the military didn't like that. The military was losing power. Long story short, the military tried to kidnap and kill him. And that's what the coup was all about. Right. But not everyone in the military supported it. So we're in our hostel and we hear this Huey helicopter or some kind of helicopter flying overhead. And I know enough about military stuff to know that when a helicopter is flying over a metropolitan area, it has to have running lights, flashing lights going off. There were no lights. Right. They only turn the lights off when they're in a war zone. So this is a bad sign. Very bad. And we had heard on the BBC radio that a helicopter had been shot down <laughs> in, in, yep. in, uh, in, in, in Ankara. And so we're thinking, oh, is this helicopter going to get shot down and crash into us? Because there were F-16s. I'm pretty sure there were F-16s, but there were fighter jets flying overhead. And we're like, okay, well, some of the military supports the coup, some of them don't. So which side are these guys on? Right. Now, on top of all of this stress, I had realized that morning I was a few days late for my cycle. And so I had in the back of my head, I might be pregnant. Yeah. I chose this time to tell him. <laughs> she may is, not have been one. It's like 1.30, 2 o'clock. She tells me we, we, that I'm late, and we're in the middle of a revolution. It's just, just took... It's his turn to put his head between his We face. were at a 9.5 maybe. Now we're at a 12. I mean, it, it, was, it was just intense. Things are going on. And then right about 2 a.m., the call to prayer from the mosques rings out. All we know is the mosques are calling people to the streets, and we don't know whether it's a call to prayer or a call to arms. Now, the, the Muslim call to prayer happens five times a day, and it's essentially just saying, you, you know, God is great, and come it's to beautiful. prayer. it is absolutely a gorgeous But they don't sound. do it at 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> and so we knew something was up. What we found out later was they were calling people to the streets to help defend the government. Come to the mosque, gather there, we'll take to the streets, we'll stop the military. Right. That was the plan, but we don't know this. We're just two, we're just we two a.m. and the blue mosque start starts going off. So it doesn't take long after that. Three a.m. We hear on the BBC radio that President Erdogan has landed in Istanbul. He wasn't in Istanbul. He lands in Istanbul. The coup is over because a lot of the coup was about stopping him, killing him, whatever. Now that he's in Istanbul, the military loses heart. They all give up. So three a.m. It's done. Internet solidifies, Facebook, Twitter solidify. We're able to assure our family that we are safe, that the coup is over. We're tired, we're exhausted, we're like, okay, well, let's get some sleep. So we right. go to bed, 
right when we turn off the lights, boom! Window shakes, mirrors rattle. The door rattles. The it's door the rattle. whole building shakes. We're like, oh my gosh, there was an explosion. So I run to the window and I'm looking for smoke. I'm looking for fire. I'm looking for what was that. What he's seen are afterburners. I see overhead the F-16s or jets or whatever. They're flying overhead. And I realized, oh, you jerks. Face Sonic boom the city. I think it was in celebration. But I think what the, the idea was, these jets, they came in. They went, they turned on their afterburners, and they did a sonic boom, and the whole city just like, earthquaked. And I was confirmed by this because I saw them coming in, and they did a second pass, and they did it again. Again, window shake, door rattles. It's terrifying. So I'm like, I, I'm, you, you destroyed any sleep I might get. That night. I'm, I'm so glad. I, you know, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been. We were going through all sorts of worst-case scenarios, no. but we made it through. We were preparing for any worst case scenario, not because we'd mistrust the Turkish people, but because twos are, coups are terrifying when you're in the middle of them. Yeah, so it, it, it's just one of those things where we kept our head on our shoulders, things could have been a lot worse, uh, but you don't know that at the time. You do not. Things can get a lot worse really quickly. So the next day, we're weary, we get up, thankfully there's some breakfast, we go up to the roof. Sunshine, brilliant day. We Beautiful day. Have some breakfast, we linger over it, have some olives. We want to make sure it's safe to leave the hostel. So it's around 10 a.m. we finally venture out. And we decide, okay, we've got these lists of places we really want to go. We haven't been to the Grand Bazaar yet. We want to go to the archaeology museum. We want to see these other museums. Right. So we get out, and no one's there. There's no tourists. The police aren't about. There was this tank parked in front of the Hagia Sophia all that week. Gone. Mm -hmm. No police at all. Not a single armed personnel protecting anybody. And so, not that many tourists for that matter. No, there's a handful of people. But, okay, let's let's keep going. The danger's probably passed. So we go to the archaeology, museum, the archaeology Museum. We see the sites, see some old Trojan artifacts, Byzantine artifacts. It's really neat. But then we decide we want to go to the Grand Bazaar. It's closed for obvious reasons. Of course. It's a crowded place. They want to keep people away. We want to go to the Army and Navy Museum, also closed, right. but for a different reason, because it's yeah, the, the Army tried to overthrow the government, and uh, it's, it's just an awkward situation. Right. So that night, we were supposed to meet with some friends of a friend, right? some Istanbul people who wanted to take us out uh, to, to have some drinks. So we joined them, thinking, is this really a good idea? Now, these guys were apparently against... Erdogan. Right. They wanted the coup to succeed. I will not share their name. So here we are, uh, riding around with our Turkish new our new Turkish friends, and they are cussing out the Erdogan supporters and the police. And the and we're just like, stop doing. I want to I want to go home. We're leaving tomorrow. I I want to not get killed. Uh, you guys have your politics. Fine. Fair enough. I leave mean, us out of please, it. Please leave us out of this. But we had a great time. We were just very nervous the whole time. And then the next day, we're like, okay, last day, our airline tickets are still to go. Right. We still have our plane. All the, the So we left at like, what, 5 o'clock? Our I plane was so. supposed to leave at 5. Every flight until noon was canceled. Right. We're at 5 p.m. Okay, and they kept on pushing it, too. Like, 2 p.m.'s canceled, 3 p.m.'s canceled. But there's one site that we really want to go to that's still open. We're just wandering around. The spice market's closed. Right. We're like, okay, there's one big palace, the right. Domobachi Palace. It's this European-style palace. It is. It's very different from the Tapi. Yes, palace. it's it's European style. They're trying to be but like the Turkish Versailles. Only one sultan ever actually lived in it. Right. It's just ostentatious as can be. Oh, it is. Everything's gilded. There's peacocks running around. Run. Yes. It was kind of hard to enjoy it. Because we were still a little anxious about everything. And she's still late. I am. I have not started my cycle yet, and so we're still concerned. Are we pregnant? Are right. we going to be stuck here? We're going to be stuck here and pregnant. Can I get us smuggled into Greece? What's going to happen? Right. So. <laughs> so we explore a little, but then we retreat to the airport early. And we have to catch, I think if my memory serves, we were actually the first flight out of Turkey. Not the first, but maybe on this airline. Because right. up until, I believe, 3 p.m., they were still canceling flights. Right. There were no flights to the United States for the next week. There were not. Every flight to the United States was canceled. Right. 
So we get to the airport, and this is where I say best case scenario for the coup happened because customs, no problem. No problem. They checked our passports, we're gone. Right. No big deal whatsoever. We get on the plane, and I just, I'm. Um, Worst case scenario, again, I'm like, what if we get shot down or, right. you know, like, I think the plane, they actually brought in bigger planes because all the planes before had been canceled. Right. And so they needed to fit more passengers to make up for the canceled flight. But what's really ominous was this was a big plane, but it was like half full. If that. It, there, were, we, there were not many people. I guess they either missed, they got earlier ways out of the country, or they were hunkering down. I don't know what's going on. But we took a GN Airlines because we're going to Athens. The second that the, the the captain calls that we're in Greek airspace. We breathe our first real uh, breath in we, we, I think that we burst into applause on the airplane. I, I, the few people who were on the flight did applaud. Yeah. So we land. We get through customs. The Greek people are like, Ooh, you got out of there. Yeah. Welcome to Greece. You know, welcome to the EU. You <laughs> know? I popped to the ladies and no baby. <gasps> oh my we're gosh. It was like, we're, we're in Greece. And we're not pregnant. Oh, it was such a relief. We, we made it out of a coup, and we're not pregnant. We immediately went and got a very stiff drink. Yeah, because we, <laughs> we, 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 we're allowed to. Because yes. she hadn't been drinking the whole time, because she was worried that so she couldn't have even any raka or beer to console the, everything. And so we made it to Athens. We didn't actually have... The weird thing was, through all that stress and terror... We didn't have to change a thing about our travel plans. We did not. We flew out on our originally scheduled flight. The only thing we missed was a few museums in the Grand Bazaar. Which, oh shame, we have to go back to Istanbul. So, despite the coup, if we ever have a chance to go back to Istanbul... We are going back. We are going back, and I still think it's one of my favorite cities ever. David and I are not much for repeating trips. However, certain cities will never be removed from our travel list, and Istanbul is... Probably number one on that list. So we will be hopefully returning to Istanbul, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more of a boring <laughs> experience, yes. and we can get some more Turkish delight at the Grand Bazaar. Absolutely. So this has been Passports and Birth Control. Don't forget your passport. Don't forget your birth control. Now today we've got what's considered the national drink of Turkey, Raka. Raka is a twice distilled liquor made of grapes and anise. Now anise, of course, is going to give it a licorice-like flavor. So if you don't like licorice, you might not like raka. Um, it's typically served in a raka glass. If you don't have that, a highball cocktail glass will work just fine. But as you can see, it's quite a bit bigger, so mind your portion. Now all you do on raka is you pour about a third of a glass. You're going to top it with an equal amount of cold water. Now when I do this, you're going to see how it got its nickname, Lion's Milk. Because when you add cold water, it turns milky. And that is it. That is the national drink of Turkey, Raka. So, salute. Like passports and birth control? Give us a review and follow us on Instagram. Tell us in the comments where you'd like us to go next. And support us on Patreon. Your support will send us more places and help us create more episodes.